we have a psychologist on board to be able to monitor our patients who are struggling post-operatively. Each week we have our multidisciplinary team meetings where we refer patients who are either new to the pathway, so just referred by the GP, or experiencing complications following surgery. Each patient needs to be cleared by our team that they fulfill the NICE criteria before proceeding along to surgery. And then after surgery, we will help hold these team meetings where we refer anyone with complications to request that we either extend our follow-up pathway or that we might deviate from it and offer additional points of follow-up or investigations of complications are arising. We see our GPs as a bit of an extension to our multidisciplinary team because they are the core person in patient care. So we liaise with them really closely around what prescriptions patients need for supplements, for medications following surgery, and if people need referral onto other specialist services. So we try to recognize when the bariatric team scope ends and we might need to actually refer on to other specialities for the best patient care. So we liaise really closely with endocrinology, haematology, and a range of other um, specialities as well, when we see that our team actually needs to seek support. So we do three main surgery types at the Whittington, the Ruin Y gastric bypass, mini bypass, and sleeve gastrectomy. And for each patient, we'll offer them a two-year package of care, which you can see along the side there is our post-operative pathway. And you can see that the dietitian is the most frequent contact point after surgery. So we're often the eyes and the ears for the team, listening out for any complications that we might need to refer back to our MDT. We see our patients in the outpatient setting, but we might do additional phone consults in between if we're worried. And at the two year point when they're reviewed by the consultant, if it's safe for discharge, we'll discharge them back to GP care. In our dietetic assessment, we follow the ABCD approach to make sure that our assessment is holistic and thorough. So I'll go through each of those assessment points now. For our anthropometric measures at baseline, when they first see the surgeon on the preoperative pathway after referral, we will look at height, weight, BMI, what is their excess body weight above their reference weight. And we'll calculate reference weight using a BMI of 25 or a BMI of 23 if they're of Asian phenotype. Then we'll recalculate these measures again at the time of surgery and at each follow-up point, we'll look at how much of their excess body weight loss they've lost. And we'll work this out as a percentage of their excess body weight at the time of surgery. Just to see if they're progressing along based on our national statistics. And you can see our expectations at the two-year point after surgery are there on my slide. So for the ruin Y or mini bypass, we expect that they'll lose about 70 to 80% of excess body weight loss at the two year point after surgery. Sleeves and bands slightly less. We usually see our patients meeting these targets though at around the one year or one and a half year point. And after that, it's about maintaining their weight loss and keeping up those good diet and exercise habits. If we're concerned about malnutrition, we'll also look at hand grip strength or middle upper, mid upper arm circumference, particularly if they're oedematous and we can't rely on weight alone. And we encourage all of our patients to self monitor their weight in between their consults so their weight isn't starting to gradually creep up without them recognizing. For our biochemistry assessment, we do blood tests at each follow up point along the pathway. And we base this on the BOMS 2014 guidelines and the ASMBS 2016 guidelines. So routinely we'll measure electrolytes, urea, liver function tests, full blood count and ferritin, folate, bone studies, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone and B12. 
We'll do HbA1c and lipids if they're diabetic or hypercholesterolemic. We don't routinely measure thiamine at all. It's quite expensive in the UK and the test uh, takes a long time to get the result back from. So we'll supplement if we've got concerns, if there's clinical signs or symptoms, or if they're high risk patients drinking alcohol or vomiting frequently. Zinc and copper will measure annually or if there are signs and symptoms. And the same for other fat soluble vitamins. We won't routinely measure vitamin A, E and K unless they're presenting as at risk and particularly if they're a bypass or duodenal switch patients where they're going to malabsorb more. I know that Arpana God, um, Govril is covering deficiencies and supplementations later on, so I won't delve into that area. For our clinical assessment, we look at gastrointestinal systems. Are they sister, symptoms? Sorry, are they presenting with reflux, nausea, and vomiting? Are they having any issues with their bowels? Um, we use the Bristol stool chart, and we look at frequency, um, sudden changes of their dietary triggers. Are there medications like iron or pain medication that could be contributing to this? Are there any signs of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Uh, are they having issues with dysphagia or abdominal pain? We look at signs and symptoms for dumping syndrome and reactive hypoglycemia. So are they having episodes of sweating, shaking, feeling faint or very fatigued? Is this happening after high sugar, high fat meals? We look at um, what their mood and mental health status is like following surgery. So in the UK, we have about one in two patients suffer from mental health conditions or depression. So, and for a lot of people, food is a comfort before surgery. So we look at how are they coping post-operatively? Have they found other strategies to cope with stress or emotions? Or are they still relying on food? We look at what social supports they've got in place. Um, have they told friends and family? It's quite common that um, some of our patients don't even tell friends and family and they keep it to themselves, um, which means how are they coping and who are they relying on to support them through? Because it's a lot of lifestyle change. And we look at physical activity levels. Are they maintaining good habits? And are they going to keep the weight off long term? As well as whether smoking and alcohol or drugs are coming into the picture after surgery, because we encourage everyone to come off alcohol and smoking for at least six weeks prior to the operation. We look at any signs or symptoms for malnutrition, be it micronutrient deficiency or protein energy malnutrition. Are they starting to lose hair? Is there weakness? Are they oedematous? And we look at adherence to our supplementation regime as well. So for our patients, we follow BOMS 2014 guidance for supplementation. Each patient will be on an A to Z multivitamin and mineral twice a day, which they'll purchase themselves. And then they'll be on prescribed calcium, vitamin D and iron. And every three months, they'll visit the GP for a B12 injection intramuscularly. At each uh, follow-up point, based on their blood tests, we'll tailor this regime. They might not need some supplements, so often our patients might come off iron, or we'll space out their B12 injections, or they might need resupplementation if there's deficiency of anything. For our dietary assessment, we look at how they're progressing with textures following surgery. So we follow two weeks of free fluid postoperatively, followed by two weeks of soft moist before progressing on to solid food at the five week point. And then at each follow up, we'll see what are their portion sizes looking like? Are they eating off a small item that we recommend? Is half of their meal coming from lean protein sources so that they're meeting their protein requirements of 60 to 80 grams a day? Are there hidden calories in their diet from sugars or fats? What are they cooking with? Are they adding lots of condiments? Are they experiencing dumping syndrome, which could be an indication there are some high sugar, high fat foods coming in? And are they following our 30, 30, 30 rule? So 30 minute gap between eating and drinking. 30 chews per mouthful and 30 minutes per meal. 
we find patients who graze and snack really struggle to meet their fluid requirements or might be eating and drinking at the same time and thereby not meeting their protein requirements or causing themselves dumping syndrome. <clears throat> are they still um, avoiding fizzy and alcohol and are they having any food aversions or struggling with problem foods? So we measure this all through a food recall or some patients bring in a food diary, which is particularly helpful. And we also look at what are their patterns and lifestyle after surgery. Are they working? Are they fasting for religious reasons? Do we need to consider if they're, <coughs> sorry, halal or kosher or are they vegetarian? And how is that affecting protein intake or fluid intake? We also look at who is preparing the meal in the household. Is it even them? And who is, if the person preparing isn't them, do they know that what their needs are following surgery? We look at someone's relationship with food. As I said, a lot of people might use eating as a comfort before surgery. What are their strategies following the operation? Uh, is there any emotional eating coming in or stress eating? non-hungry eating which might contribute to weight regain in the future? Do they have a history of binge eating disorder or other eating disorders like bulimia nervosa? And could this trigger a need for psychological referral after the operation, which we need to do through the GP? And what are their barriers for change? Are there financial constraints which putting pressure on meeting their requirements or are there time pressures? Now, I'm aware I probably don't have time to go through this full list of how we manage complications after surgery, but you do have access to my slides. So I'll just go through a couple. So with altered bowel habits, if, it, if they're presenting with diarrhea, we think, are there any food triggers? Is there fatty food in the diet or is there lactose triggering diarrhea? Are they having enough fluid to replace their losses? We consider a referral to gastroenterology. They might do a celiac screen. They might look at fecal elastase. They might look at inflammatory bowel disease markers or referral on for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth testing through hydrogen breath test. And if they're a switch or a bypass patient, we consider fat-soluble vitamin replacement. For constipation, we look at <clears throat> fluid, fiber, and physical activity. And are there iron or pain medications contributing to this issue? For nausea, vomiting, reflux, we'll look at are they following the golden rules? Are they chewing their food, eating slowly and leaving a gap between eating and drinking? Or are they pushing the boundaries and eating or drinking too much at one time? Are they on a protein pump inhibitor? Do they need thiamine if they're vomiting regularly? And do they need investigations through endoscopy or contrast studies? If they've got abdominal pain, we'll look at whether there are, um, are risk factors from ulcers like smoking or alcohol. I'll skip forward now to protein malnutrition. Do they need oral supplements um, like intra or 40 sip, or do we need to consider intra or feeding? In some severe cases, we've had to look at reversal of Roux and Y gastric bypass for our patients that have severe protein malnutrition. <coughs> And if they're experiencing reactive hypoglycemia, how can we tailor their food pattern? So we might need to look at small frequent meals that are really low in carbohydrate. We might need to consider pectin or guao gum. So we recommend them adding 15 grams into their meals to slow gastric emptying. The surgeon might prescribe arcabos to help reduce their symptoms. And if these first line measures don't resolve it, then we might need to refer on to endocrinology. How am I going for time? Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> All right, I'll wrap up. Um, so we also look at how we can support patients outside of the clinic room. So our team carries around an emergency support cell phone, which the dietitian or nurse will carry during office hours, um, which patients are given the number to on the day of their operation. They can call us at any time after surgery. We also have an ambulatory care unit as part of our centre. 
So if patients are presenting with severe micronutrient deficiencies that might not be corrected at the GP practice if they need infusions or intramuscular injections, particularly for iron, vitamin D or Pabrinex for thiamine, then we might invite them along to our ambulatory care centre, which is um, a walk-in centre, but we will arrange with the team there rather than them, them, them waiting hours in A&E or having to wait until their next clinic appointment. And we also hold a monthly evening support group for pre and post-operative patients, um, which is held in the evening and led by either the nurse or the dietitian. And we invite along guest speakers. So as I said before, we don't have a lot of psychological input post-operatively, but we might invite guest psychology speakers along to this group. So in conclusion, um, monitoring of patients after bariatric surgery um, is it's really important to have close follow-up and um, the dietetic input needs to be holistic and individualized because no person's journey is the same and we're often the eyes and ears for the rest of the team. So we need to be on the lookout for complications to refer to our MDT. And we also need to recognize when the bariatric teams we need to refer on to other specialities as an extension of our team if it's outside of our scope. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, everyone. I can't hear you. I'll message you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you a bit better, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the great talk and uh, the big round of applause. Thank you for having broken up to young audience. We will look forward to interacting with your new institution and I'll check out for the next talk. I'm quite struggling to hear as well. Am I right in thinking it's uh, my turn to go now? Hi, Ellen. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you a little. <laughs> are you ready with your presentation? Yes, I am. So, uh, can you let me welcome Ellen, who joined us from Birmingham, working up early just for a Saturday holiday to share with us my experience. So, uh, I think you could share your presentation. Can you see that? Pardon? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the introduction. So as um, Aaron said, my name is Helen Horton. I am a registered dietitian from Birmingham in the United Kingdom. And today I'm going to be talking about the rational combination of diet and exercise. So just a brief bit about my professional background just to start. So currently I'm working as a bariatric and research dietitian at University Hospitals Birmingham, and that's for four days each week. And then for one day a week, I'm at Birmingham University and I'm on a course for clinical academics, learning all about the research skills needed to become um, a proper clinical academic. So in my previous experience, I've been working as a dietitian for quite a few years now, probably about five or six. And I've got experience in bariatrics, weight management, oncology, and also general medicine. So this is just a brief outline about what I'll be covering today. Firstly, I'll be going through the current recommended guidelines for exercise. Then I'll talk about how we can adapt exercise for people living with obesity. I'll be talking about some of the exercise considerations following bariatric surgery and some of the dietary considerations that go alongside those. And then I think we're doing questions at the end of all three of our presentations. So these are the current recommended physical activity guidelines for adults. So if you're interested in the guidelines for children, adolescents or older people, these are also available on the World Health Organization website. 
So just to um, go through the adult recommendations, we recommend that adults do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity, vigorous, um, moderate intensity aerobic activity each week, or they can do 75 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic activity, or an equivalent combination of moderate and vigorous. This should be um, performed in at least 10 minute bouts at a time. And for additional health benefits, adults should actually double the above guidelines. So doing 300 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 150 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. And also adults should be doing two days or more of um, muscle strengthening activities in addition to the aerobic. So that's just a brief outline of the current recommendations. And this is a nice um, infographic that I got from the UK government website. And I think it just nicely conveys all the methods that we're trying to cover in regards to physical activity. So um, moderate intensity activity, you can see here on the left of the presentation, and that would be things like swimming, going on a brisk walk or cycling. But some other examples I have here would be doing some water aerobics or doing doubles tennis, pushing a lawnmower, hiking or volleyball. Whereas the vigorous intensity activity would be things like running, um, running up the stairs, doing sports, things like um, aerobics, football, using a skipping rope, martial arts, all these things are classed as more vigorous intensity activity. And the difference between the two is um, the moderate intensity activity should increase your breathing, but you should still be able to talk to the person beside you. Whereas the vigorous intensity activity, you should be quite short of breath when you're doing those sorts of activities. And then of course, in the middle, building strength. So building strength to keep muscles, bones and joints strong for two days a week. So we know that exercise is good for us, but why is it so hard to lose weight even when doing exercise? So we have patients come to clinic time and time again saying that they've tried exercising in the past, but they're struggling to lose weight. They sometimes even gain weight. So um, this article um, by King et al in 2007 nicely sort of summarized why that could be. And they summarized that perhaps it's due to compensatory responses to having a negative energy balance. So these could be automatic, so metabolic responses. So when we exercise, we know that our resting metabolic rate can reduce, which makes it more difficult to lose weight. Or they could be volitional. So if we're exercising, we're more likely to potentially have a snack beforehand or a snack afterwards, which could potentially counteract the fact that you're losing all these calories from exercise. So it's important to think of these two or three things when exercising, um, as well as trying to lose weight. That being said, there's been many studies that have actually shown that exercise alongside bariatric surgery is actually really beneficial and can create a lot more weight loss than bariatric surgery alone. So this is just one of many studies by um, Egbert et al. from 2007, 2012, sorry. And it's a systematic review of 17 publications um, exploring exercise in bariatric patients. And in 15 of these studies, there was actually a positive relationship shown and better analysis demonstrated that in patients participating in exercise, a standardized mean of 3.62 kilograms greater weight loss compared to the moderate exercise group. So we know that exercise is good for us um, and we know that bariatric patients potentially lose more weight if they're exercising but there are obviously many barriers to physical activity and I've just sort of put a few of them here on this um, diagram here but there's obviously many more that you might experience in practice. So patients might find it difficult to find fitness clothing that actually fits them in their larger sizes. People might suffer with sweat rashes or chafing, which would make exercise unappealing to continue or to do again. People might feel embarrassed if they're exercising and they might be worried about equipment holding their weight. They may not be able to keep up with the rest of the class. For example, if they're doing an aerobics class, they might be falling behind and that could lead to further embarrassment. And even people have told me that they're too scared to exercise because they have a fear of having a heart attack and something going wrong with their health while they're exercising. So these are just some of the barriers that we can have to physical activity, especially in people living with obesity. So with that in mind, there are lots of ways that we advise to adapt exercise for people living with obesity. 
And these are just a few of the things that we've, uh, we recommend. So firstly, chair exercises. They're a great alternative for people who struggle with their mobility. And there's just a few examples here on the um, side of the screen. Things like chest stretches, upper body twists, hip marching. I got this, um, this leaflet from the NHS website, but there's lots of different available resources. There's also something called the Couch to 5K Running Plan, which is a series of podcasts. So week by week, they build you up from just doing 30 seconds of running at a time, all the way up to around 30 minutes. So it gradually builds you up and gets people's confidence up with exercising and jogging. Advising 10 minute workouts, so doing short bursts of activity, rather than thinking that they have to go to a full 60 minute exercise lesson, just doing 10 minutes at a time and still teaching people that that is still beneficial for their health. Um, aiming for 10,000 steps each day. So if people aren't managing 10,000 steps, just ask what they're managing now and gradually build it up, sort of 100 steps each week, for example. Advising fitness videos. So lo there's loads of YouTube videos, great exercise classes online. And if people are worried about going to the gym, if they're embarrassed, then they can do that from the comfort of their own home. So it's a lot more achievable for many people. And then just some simple things like parking the car a little further away from the office, going for a walk in your lunch break, taking the kids to and from school, and then planning active activities at the weekend, things that get you outside and get you moving. Um, so these are just some of the examples that we use to help to adapt exercise for people living with obesity. And most importantly, the bottom bullet point, so reminding patients that exercise doesn't just mean the gym, it can mean all these things and it sort of can be inclusive for everybody. So thinking more about the exercise considerations following bariatric surgery. So the main question that I get asked in my practice is when can I start exercising following bariatric surgery? And the answer is it will differ from surgeon to surgeon, from centre to centre to centre. Everyone might recommend a slightly different process. But we advise to get up and moving as soon as possible to get the blood flowing, to hopefully reduce the risk of getting any blood clots or anything post-op. So get up as soon as able. And then before wounds are healed, focus on getting back to doing normal activities, things like washing the dishes, doing things around the house, doing relaxation exercises and deep breathing, and then going for short walks. So take it easy before the wounds are healed. And then once the wounds are healed, incorporate things like swimming, longer walks, and some low intensity aerobic activity. We do advise to avoid heavy lifting or abdominal exercises for around two months um, after the operation, but it could be longer um, if you're struggling to heal. And obviously if open surgery is performed rather than laparoscopic, the recovery time will be slightly longer and therefore take caution when building the exercise tolerance. And we do advise to try and build up to the recommendations that I showed you on the earlier slides. So including the aerobic exercise and the weight resistance exercise to get the most benefits out of your exercise following bariatric surgery. And also always reminding the patients of why we recommend um, exercise following bariatric surgery. So I've just listed a few of the, the main points here. So exercise can really improve skin elasticity after it after a bariatric surgery and it can help to maintain weight loss so a lot of patients say that they lose weight really well in the first year even the second year and then they might notice that weight starts to come back on again so we do recommend starting to get some exercise into their routine because that can really tend to help to reduce that weight regain it also helps to preserve and build lean muscle, of course, and it can boost metabolism, enhance self-esteem and build new social networks. So some patients may have many social networks that are around unhealthy things like going out to eat, going out to drink alcohol, all these things um, won't help with their weight loss journey. But if they can build social networks through fitness, that can be a great way to keep them um, in a social network and help them with their weight loss. And also exercise can, of course, um, reduce the risk of developing comorbidities, things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So reminding them of why they're doing it, it can really enhance their health. 
And of course, exercise can improve mood and reduce anxiety. So there are many benefits to exercise following bariatric surgery. And I just like to remind patients if they are struggling to come back to a list like this to remind themselves to keep going. So just going into some of the dietary considerations following bariatric surgery. Um, firstly, water. So it can be difficult to keep hydrated following bariatric surgery due to perhaps having a smaller stomach or being able to manage slightly less water at a time. So we do encourage small sips throughout the workout and adequate intake in the day beforehand and after to keep themselves well hydrated. Um, proteins obviously essential if we're exercising to build um, and repair muscle. Um, however, often patients can regurgitate meat, which is obviously a great source of protein following bariatric surgery. So we do advise um, things like milk, yogurt, cheese, low-fat cheeses, um, fish, things that are easier to manage. Um, and also, of course, always following the recommended eating techniques. So chewing well, waiting between each mouthful, um, all of these things can really help to manage um, more protein sources. Thinking more about carbohydrate, a lot of people use carbs, carbohydrates um, as an energy source when they're exercising before or afterwards. But just to keep in mind, obviously carbohydrates can lead to dumping syndrome. So keep that in mind with patients when advising for snacks around workouts or choose complex carbohydrates to help hopefully reduce the risk of dumping syndrome. Things like um, brown rice, wholemeal bread or wholemeal pasta. Thinking more about the meal size, so when we have bariatric surgery, the portion sizes we can manage can be quite small. We do have patients telling us perhaps they can only manage one tablespoon of food at a time. And this doesn't help to build the reserves you need to exercise and it can help lead to people feeling hungry or low in energy. So we say perhaps trying to have a meal replacement shake a couple of hours before activity to boost their levels ahead of time. Um, and also reinforcing basic dietary, bariatric dietary advice. So if they do say that they're feeling hungry after bariatric surgery, reminding patients that although they're hungry, the portion sizes that will fill them will still be relatively small. So this is just an example on the screen of our seven inch side plate. So keeping the portions really small and balancing the plate with you know, the half vegetables or salad, one quarter carbs and one quarter protein. And reminding them not to put it on a big plate because that that's what it would look like on the larger plate and that's not the portion that they'll probably need um, when they're exercising following bariatric surgery. Thank you, that was everything. <laughs> I can, it's a bit quiet. <laughs> so, uh, the laptop mic is not able to pick up the sound of the applause from the audience. I, I message you. I will message you. Pardon? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you talking to me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. The audio from my side is not very good. Okay. But we could hear you very clearly. Thank you very much. I've recorded okay. the talk as well. And okay. I'll I'll say I'll message to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye bye. You're welcome. So... Oh.